I'm Fitzpatrick. I'm the president of Phi Sigma Tau. That's the Philosophy Honor Society here at Chico State. And what we've been doing this semester is bringing in guest speakers from all over the country to share their insights into relevant philosophical topics. And so we're, we're really glad to have you all here. We hope you find the talk stimulating and interesting. Um, we'll have one of our professors introduce our speaker here in a minute, Dr. David Pitt. And uh, he, he does a lot of work in um, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, but today I think you're going to get uh, a really interesting discussion in t an area that he's recently been um, doing some thinking about. So I think you're Animal husbandry in 16th century China. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, if, if you enjoy today's talk, we do a lot of things like this throughout the semester. We put on... Um, guest lectures by students, by local faculty. We have roundtable discussions. So if you enjoy this kind of a venue, we encourage you to go to our website. It's uh, csuchico.edu slash PST. That's the initials for our club. And it'll have on there an events list for all the different things that we do throughout the semester. Unfortunately, this is it for this semester. As you guys know, next week's dead week. So we're going to be worrying about finals like all of, probably most of you. But uh, next semester, we, we're going to have a great lineup. We're going to have three more uh, guest speakers coming in, and we're going to be doing a big panel discussion on the future of science and religion. So we encourage all of you to go to our website and uh, check out more events like this in the future. So without further ado, we'll get going. And uh, Robert Jones, one of the local professors of philosophy here at Chico State, will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Michael, and thanks everyone for showing up today to our philosophy series talk. And I'd like to say thanks, especially thank you to Michael for basically providing the energy to get these things together and all the logistics. So he's done a great job. So it's been a great first semester for the philosophy series talks. Yeah, my name is Robert Jones. I'm a professor in the philosophy department. And um, it's such a pleasure to have David Pitt come here and give a talk. Um, let me tell you a little bit about David. Um, David has a PhD in philosophy from the Graduate Center of University, City University of New York, and he also has a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in music composition. So, kind of a renaissance guy. Um, and he specializes in uh, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, and philosophy of language. Um, he is currently a professor at one of our sister colleges, California State University, Los Angeles. So he flew all the way from Los Angeles today. But he's all, he has a varied um, employment history. Um, whoever said it's easy to get a job in philosophy didn't know what he was talking about. So David's worked a lot of places. For example, University of Nebraska. He's taught at Brooklyn College, Iowa State University, um, Hunter College, Swarthmore College. So he's been around in the teaching circuit. Um, David is... Uh, he has a lot of stuff published, um, and some of the articles that he's, he has, he has an article forthcoming in, a, in an anthology of Oxford University Press, Introspection Pheno Phenomenality and the Availability of Intentional Content, and Intentional Psychologism and Philosophical Studies, the Phenomenology of Cognition, or What It's Like to Think That P. It's a very good paper, I read it, and that was in Phenomenological Re Philosophy and Phenomenological Research. And his favorite paper of mine is Alter Egos and Their Names. That was in the Journal of Philosophy. Um, and he has tons of other papers and encyclopedia entries. And I'm going to skip that. But I'll tell you a little bit about his research interests. His main research interest is in the development of a phenomenally based theory of intentional content. So he does philosophy of mind, um, wherein each thought has a distinctive and cognitively proprietary phenomenology. So he's bucking the trend of the philosophy of mind these days. Um, anyway, well, let me just, I could go on and on, but I won't. i stop and introduce and let David come up and talk, so let's uh, give a warm Chico welcome to Dr. David Pitt. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so this is kind of a sequel to your favorite paper of mine, you want to alter egos and your names. Um, and it's, it's, it's still warm, I mean, it's really hot off the presses, um, so I'm trying out a new, a new idea. Um, okay, so it's 
uh, called How to Tell a Statue from a Lump, which is not about philosophy of mind. Suppose you take a lump of clay and make a statue of a forest out of it. Let's call the statue Eddie. It seems that as you sit and admire your work, you've got one thing, Eddie, a statue of a horse made out of clay before you. But now consider the lump of clay you made Eddie out of. Let's call him Lumpy. Lumpy existed before Eddie did. And Lumpy could continue to exist even if you decided that you didn't like Eddie anymore and squished him. Thus it seems that there are things true of Eddie that are not true of Lumpy and vice versa. But Leibniz's law, the indiscernibility of identicals, tells us that if a thing X is identical to a thing Y, then X and Y must have all the same properties. This is because if X is identical to Y, then there's only one thing, though it's referred to by two different names. And hence, X can't have properties Y doesn't have for the same reason that X can't have properties that X doesn't have. But Lumpy has properties. For example, existence at a time T, 10 minutes before you made Eddie, possible existence at a time t plus n minutes after you squish Eddie, that Eddie doesn't have. Sorry, possible existence at a time t plus n 10 minutes after you squish Eddie, that Eddie doesn't have. So it would seem to follow that Eddie and Lumpy are two distinct objects. The problem with there being two distinct objects is that they would be, as long as Eddie, Eddie survives, in the same place at the same time. Physics tells us, however, that two distinct things at least of the size of Eddie and Lumpy, can't occupy the same place at the same time. Maybe quarks or electrons or something weirder can, but not medium-sized dry goods like statues and lumps of clay. So we've got a puzzle. We've got reasons for thinking that Eddie and Lumpy are distinct objects, and reasons for thinking they can't be. Welcome to philosophy. Your life is now ruined. <laughs> and it's not just things like statues and their constituent materials that present this puzzle. There are all kinds of things, ordinary, otherwise probably boring things, that raise exactly the same problem. Consider your left hand, for example. Now suppose you clench it into a fist. Is your fist something different from your hand? Well, your hand existed before your fist did, and it can continue to exist after you unclench your fist. So it would seem that they have to be different things. And, and now you've got two hands and two fists at the end of your arms. Uh-oh. Likewise, a paper airplane and the paper it's made of, the puddle of water in your ice cube tray, and the cube it becomes if you leave it in the freezer long enough, a snowball and the snow you make it, made it out of, etc., etc. But as you might want to, there's no escaping the annoying mysteries of metaphysics. They're everywhere. People have tried all kinds of solutions to this type of problem, including accepting that there can be coincident entities, that is, distinct objects existing in the same place at the same time, the physicists are just wrong. What do they know about metaphysics? Denying that there really are such things as statues, fists, paper, airplanes, and ice cubes, or for that matter, hands, pieces of paper, and puddles of water. All there really is is elementary particles, quarks, or whatever. Ordinary citizens are just wrong. And physicists are better metaphysicians than philosophers. A, a third uh, kind of solution is to recognize uh, what Gareth Matthews calls kooky objects such as lumpy eddy-shaped, hands clenched, paper folded, and water frozen, objects that exist more or less momentarily and are relatively easy to dispose of. Some people think Aristotle believed in such things. I find these solutions counterintuitive. It seems to me that the physicists are in their rights to deny that distinct objects can be coincident, and con common sense agrees. Moreover, there really are statues, fists, paper, airplanes, and ice cubes, as well as lumps of clay, hands, pieces of paper, and puddles of water. And I think it's just wrong to think of, to use Aristotle's example, Socrates seated as a different object from Socrates. Um, I'd like to have a solution that respects these scientific facts and ordinary intuitions about these ordinary objects. To cut to the chase, what I propose is that those statues, fists, etc., exist. They aren't objects, but in a very special sense, to be detailed in a moment, parts of objects. But this will take some setting up. I'll begin with another solution I think doesn't work, but which it's important to understand in order to follow me where I'm going. There's a debate in metaphysics about the nature of concrete, that is, spatiotemporal objects. Some philosophers, called three dimensionalists, think that concrete objects have only three dimensions, their height, length, and width, and that the parts of such, such objects are just their spatial parts, the bits you might pull out of them or chip off of them. Other philosophers, called four-dimensionalists, four think that concrete objects have, in fact, four dimensions, their height, length, 
width, and their duration, that is, the time during which they exist. On this view, concrete objects have both spatial and temporal parts. The three-dimensionalist says that objects are spread out only in space, and that at any given moment in an object's existence, it exists, as they say, wholly and completely. When you're gazing on your creation, Eddie, you're gazing at him in his entirety, or at least his visible surface in its entirety. He's all there at every moment of his existence. The four-dimensionalist says that objects are spread out in, in time as well as space, and that any given moment of an object's existence, sorry, that at any given moment of an object's existence, only part of the object, a temporal part, exists. All you can really gaze at when you're gazing at Eddie is a temporal part of him. Um, Eddie from 1 p.m. to 1.15 p.m., as it might be. These theories of the nature of concrete objects are used to give different explanations of persistence, that is, the continued existence of objects through time. The three-dimensionalist, who's also called an endurantist, says that what it is for an object to exist from time t to a time t plus n is for it, the whole thing, to exist at t, t plus n, and all times in between. Time does not, so to speak, intrude into the object and partially constitute it. Objects exist in and through time, but not vice versa. The four-dimensionalist, also called a perdurantist, says that a concrete object persists from t to t plus n just in case it has a temporal part, or time slice, as they call them, that exists during that interval. On this view, a complete concrete object is made up of temporal as well as spatial parts. Eddy is a space-time worm whose endpoints, nose and tail, if worms have noses and tails, are the beginning and end of Eddy's existence, the moment of his creation to the moment of his squishing. Time is as much a constituent of Eddy as the clay he's made of and all its parts. Clearly, the three-dimensionalist has the home team advantage. Common sense has it that it's possible to, say, hold an apple in your hand at any given time, the whole thing, and not just a part of it. And if you choose to eat it, it's metaphysically possible to eat it all. So why on earth would anybody want to be a four-dimensionalist? The reason is that going 4D allows for solutions to certain metaphysical puzzles, not unrelated to the one we started with, that are arguably, at least, better than the solutions you'd have available if you stuck with just three dimensions. Here's one example. Suppose you decide to grow tomatoes. You plant some vines in your backyard, and one day you're excited to find the first fruit of your labor. Small, green, hard, and no doubt bitter, but there it is, your first tomato. Suppose you're sentimental and decide to give it a name. You call it June. Every day you check on June, anxious for the time where you can pluck her from the vine, slice her plump, juicy body, and consume her with basil, mozzarella, olive oil, and salt. <laughs> Eventually, June realizes her potential as a snack. She's no longer small, green, hard, and bitter, but large, red, soft, and sweet. Is, the same is she the same tomato she once was? Well, surely she's changed. On her last day, she's qualitatively different from the way she was on her first day. But is she still June? Is she numerically the same tomato that appeared on the vine on the first day? Well, it's not like some other tomato somehow got attached to the vine in exactly the same place at some point. Common sense suggests that she has maintain, maintained her identity, she's June all along, through the changes in, the, in her characteristics that we call ripening. And the three-dimensionalist agrees. But now we have a puzzle. For notice that if June on day one, let's call her June one, is numerically identical to June on day n, call her June n, then Leibniz's law, the law of the indiscernibility of identicals, tells us that June 1 and June n must have all their properties in common, but they don't. June 1 is small, green, etc., whereas June n is, n is large, red, etc. Common sense says it's the same tomato, though changed, whereas Leibniz's law says that since it changed, it can't be the same tomato. The least we have that seem independently plausible turn out to be jointly inconsistent. Puzzle. <laughs>